I heard an old story. Thank you for tuning in to the television ministry of Clay's Mill Baptist Church. Join us as we share our passion for soul winning, spiritual growth, and revival in our state and nation. And now, Pastor Jeff Fugit. Well, good evening and welcome to the program tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you will, take time to text or call a friend and tell them. Brother Fugit and his family are on television, and uh, we're so glad to uh, be with you. And if you also are watching by way of Facebook, if you would share the program, it will multiply the opportunity we have to get the gospel and the preaching of the Word of God getting the message out. We appreciate the many folks who share our program and the multiplied thousands of people that watch by way of WLJC television and our Facebook Live programs. And so welcome tonight. We're glad that you're here. It's a very special Saturday evening as tomorrow is Easter Sunday. What a wonderful, wonderful celebration that it is, Easter Sunday. There's nothing more beautiful than to see families, children, teens coming in, I love to see the new Easter dresses. I, I love to see uh, the new Easter suits. I love it. I love it. It's an exciting time. I remember as a boy getting a new suit to, for Easter. And uh, you remember those old polyester suits? They were almost like plastic. And this is the truth. I remember it being cold on Easter Sunday morning, cold enough that we had. Now, now you probably think, man, this guy's got to be 125 years old. But I grew up in southeast Kentucky where we had coal stove heat in the 70s and in every part of our church building. We had a large church and our auditorium would hold probably 350, maybe 400 people. And we had a big Sunday school building and in every building we had a coal stove. And I remember, this is the truth, I remember uh, folks uh, backing up to that coal stove on a Sunday a cold Sunday morning. By the way, we always had sunrise service uh, growing up. We don't have sunrise service here because of all the busy schedule and activities going on. And, uh, but, but, but we were standing uh, with our hands behind our back there, uh, backed up to that uh, coal stove. And I remember smelling the burning of plastic. And one fella, I remember his name, one fella, he got too close to the coal stove and that polyester suit began to melt uh, because of the heat of that coal stove, I, I, that coal stove. I, I remember the coal stove was in the back and of course we had fans uh, to blow it and that kind of thing, but it was colder up front uh, than it was in the back of the building. And I told my dad, I said, you ought to put the coal stove up on the platform or behind the uh, uh, platform area and it bring everybody closer to the front of the church. And we, we talked about that, but the memories of Easter Sunday. And uh, sure, I'm thankful for the fact that I serve a risen and a living Lord. If you are watching me tonight and you've never received Christ as your personal Savior, there could be no better time than today. There could be no better time than right now for you to, first of all, understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second of all, understand the wages of sin is death. Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The Bible says this is the second death. And so for you to realize that you've sinned, the penalty and wages of sin is death. And according to the Bible, that is a death in hell. But the third thing, to realize that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, that's you, that's me. We are a whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you now would say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and I need to be saved and I trust you now as my personal savior, I accept your payment on the cross of Calvary for my sin. I want to be your child. My dear friend, he will come into your heart and he'll save you right now. He'll forgive your sin. He'll put your name in the Lamb's book of life. And there could be no better time than right now today to trust Christ as your personal Savior. And you ought to do that now if you haven't. We'd love to have you come and join us at church tomorrow. Sunday school in the morning will begin at 930 
There is a Sunday school class for every age, grade, and group. It's always an exciting and a delightful time. I love teaching Sunday school. I love opening the Word of God and teaching the Sunday school lesson. And then in the morning at 1030 is our morning service. And then again tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. every Sunday evening. And by the way, you talk about an old-time revival-style service. Uh, that's on Sunday night. Every service is good, but there's something just old-fashioned about that Sunday night service. I love it. And then Wednesday night, every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we study the Word of God. And I understand the work schedules and the busyness of folks, but you ought to put in your schedule church. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. You ought to come to Bible study on Wednesday night. We start at seven o'clock. We're typically most always out the door by 10 minutes, no later than 15 minutes after eight. And I say out the door, many of us stay in fellowship for a long time. And that's a common thing here uh, at our church. It's a, as it is a fun and a a happy place. So you ought to come be with us tomorrow being Easter Sunday. We'd love to have you. We have plenty of room. We have plenty of room. We have our new big auditorium. We can seat 1,500 people. Uh, right now we have it set up for about 1,200 folk and we would love for you to come be with us in the morning, Easter Sunday morning. There's plenty of parking. There's a Sunday school. I'm sorry. There is a nursery uh, for every age and then there's a children's church for the little children nurseries for the baby. It's all set up, staffed by professional staff. They do a great job. I'd just love to have you come and be with us. I'll be preaching around the country uh, in the next few days. And let me mention these quickly. April 1st and 2nd, Rockwell, North Carolina, West Park Baptist Church. April 8 and 9, Gospel Light Baptist Church, Hastings, Michigan. And then uh, uh, April 11th, the Baptist Leadership Conference in Mesquite, Texas. April 15, 16, First Baptist Church, Urbandale, Iowa. April 22nd, 23rd, New Hope Baptist Church, Lexington, Indiana. April 23rd, in the morning time, National Revival Fires Conference, Bourbonnet, Illinois. April 29 and 30, Frederick Baptist Church in Frederick, Maryland. If you live in those areas, we'd love for you to come and be a part of those revival services or conferences, whatever the case may be that the church is hosting. But I would love to see you and meet you and have you a part of those meetings. Well, I've enjoyed chatting with you this evening, give you some announcements and telling you about what's going on. Let me get to a first song here. I sure appreciate my wife and boys. I believe uh, Joel, Jeremy, and my wife are singing the special songs uh, uh, for this evening that have been recorded. And I look forward to this good song. It'll be a blessing to you right now. To Canaan's land I'm on my way soul of man never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul of man never dies. No sad farewell, no tear dim dies. Where all is love and the soul of man never dies. The rose is blooming there for me where the soul of man never dies. And I will spend eternity where the soul of man never dies. No sad farewell, there'll be no tear dies. Where all is love and the soul no sad farewells, no tear dim dies, where all is love, and the soul never dies, and the soul never dies. I'm preaching tonight from the book of Nehemiah in chapter 1. 
last Saturday evening, I preached from this same passage, and I preached from the verses of 2, 3, and 4. And I'll review that a bit, uh, uh, a bit uh, just a minute, and then I will uh, give you the message for this evening. Uh, when we open the book of Nehemiah, he is in Babylon and he is working for the king as a cupbearer to the king. He's very blessed. Uh, he has a good job and things are going very well in the life of Nehemiah. However, his world is turned upside down when his brothers come to see him. Hananiah is named specifically and other of his brethren are mentioned and they have a typical casual conversation. If you came to see me and I hadn't seen you in a while and you were from our hometown, I would say, hey, how are things going back at home? That's the question that Nehemiah asked. He said, how are things back in Jerusalem? How are things going of the remnant that is left behind there? And Nehemiah got the surprise of his life and his heart was turned upside down when he heard, Nehemiah, the people are a reproach. The walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire. When Nehemiah heard that things back home are not going well, in fact, they're going terrible and it is a shame and the people of God and the place of God is a reproach, the Bible says that Nehemiah sat down and he wept. He sat down and he wept. And we talked about this last week, and I preached about how it ought to break our hearts to the place of prayer when we see the condition of our nation and we, we remember it 20 years ago and 40 years ago and 50 and 60 and some can remember farther back and compare that to the, to, uh, uh, the uh, uh, happenings of today and the culture of today, our hearts should be broken. So Nehemiah, he sits down, he weeps, he cries, and then the Bible says he begins to pray and fast to the God of heaven. I want to preach to you tonight about the prayer that Nehemiah prayed. It is so important that we not only pray, but we learn how to pray. And throughout the Word of God, we have several examples and illustrations of how people prayed in various situations and circumstances uh, in their lives. Here, Nehemiah hears about his hometown, about his homeland, Jer uh, Jerusalem, and how Israel is just uh, in shambles because of their sin. He sits down, he weeps, and he begins uh, to pray. I want to begin reading it now in verse number 5. This is the prayer of Nehemiah. He says this, and we can learn from this because uh, this is a prayer that you and I should pray from our hearts. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him, and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Verse number 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you among the nations. Now, he recalls uh, the commandment of Moses. Now, it's very important to notice this because in Nehemiah's day, we're many years removed uh, from the days and life of Moses, but he goes back to that commandment. In fact, every revival in the Word of God goes back to the law and back to the days of Moses when Moses received those ten commandments. And so I, I was preaching on revival a few weeks ago as I preach about revival often, and a man said to me, he said, you keep quoting the Old Testament. And he said that as if the Old Testament is antiquated or outdated and obsolete for our day. 
And I said, my dear brother, the Lord Jesus preached from the Old Testament most every time he preached, and God preserved the Old Testament. And I understand its place and time and how it affects us today. And I am not a Jew living in Israel, but it's those Judeo-Christian principles that our nation was founded upon that prospered our nation as it did. And I want to tell you, dear friend, uh, that that as Nehemiah quoted Moses, so we need to see what the law is, the standard is, because we can't be restored to that unless we know what that is. We keep changing the standard of what's right and what's wrong, and we live in this woke society where the rules are changing day after day, and you don't know what pronouns that folks are wanting to use today uh, compared to yesterday and tomorrow. Hey, dear friend, the standard is not the feeling and emotions of whoever's teaching in the universities today. Uh, The standard is the law of God. The standard is the word of God. I preach it. I hold it before you tonight and say that's what Nehemiah took the people back to and that is what we need to go back to understanding if there's a restoration we need to know what it looked like originally so we can go back to that. And so we have the prayer of Nehemiah. I want to give you several points uh, from the prayer of Nehemiah that will help us in our praying for our nation. First of all, his prayer involved praise. His prayer involved praise. He called God the great and terrible God. Now the word terrible does not mean bad or awful. It means as the word great does, it means magnificent or almighty. Has the ability both to create and the ability to destroy First of all, he praised God. If we don't recognize where revival can come from, we cannot muster up a revival with statements on a paper. We cannot muster up a revival with our stir of emotion. We have revival when it comes from the life-giving God that we serve. And so his prayer began with praise. And I want to say tonight, To God be the glory, and may the God of heaven be praised. May the light of heaven shine on this dark culture today and reveal its transgression and reveal its wickedness and reveal its sin as you would take a bright light into a dark room to clean it up. You begin by shining the light, and Nehemiah recognized that it is the God of heaven that we must to pray too. We're not appealing to Caesar. Hey, we're not appealing to a king. Uh, We're not appealing to a governor or to a president. He's appealing to the great and the terrible God of heaven. And he said, I praise who you are. That's where our prayers for revival began. Second of all, it was a prayer of perseverance. It wasn't one night before he went to bed. It wasn't one time when he was feeling bad and read a bad report in the paper. No, sir, when he recognized the condition of Jerusalem, he began to weep and to pray, and it was a prayer of perseverance. He says in verse number 6, I pray day and I pray night. He had a period and times of no eating or of fasting. He said, I'd rather be satisfied with an answer from heaven than to be satisfied with the temporal bread of this world. And eating is important. I understand that. But there are some times that we need to get so hungry for God to move among us that we spend a persevering time in prayer. Now, I've heard the phrase growing up, praying through. Now, some may apply that to salvation and think that it takes three, four, five, six hours to get a hold of God so you can be saved. No, sir, God gave his son that we could have eternal life. And if you'll call on him for salvation, he will save you the second that you believe in him. 
But this matter of praying through is is applied to the child of God who prays and perseveres in prayer until the answer comes. I don't have time in this message to give illustrations and examples of that in the Bible, but if we're going to have a revival in America, we must have some persevering in prayer. And so we find, first of all, uh, that his prayer began with praise, recognizing who God is. Second of all, it was a prayer of perseverance. He didn't just pray one time, but he prayed day and night and a season of prayer. By the way, he prayed until he got an answer of how to move forward. He wasn't praying so God could do everything. He was praying to get instruction from God of what he could do. You say, preacher, how long do we pray? We pray until God gives us the direction of moving forward and what we need to do in a particular situation in our life. So it was a prayer of perseverance. Third of all, it was a prayer of repentance. It was a prayer of repentance. Now, this is an amazing and a powerful outline that will work in our day. It was a prayer of repentance. He prayed that God would forgive the sins of both he and his fathers. And I want you to notice what he says here in verse number 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee. Uh, We weren't fair with you. Uh, We were deceitful. We were corrupt in our dealings with you. Now, what's an example of that? Well, uh, the Sabbath day was a high and holy day. Uh, The Jews were not to work on the Sabbath day. It was a day to worship God. But they thought, well, if we work seven days, that's another day of increase. That's another day of income. Now, God had told them, if you'll just work the six days a week, and you'll give the seventh day to worship and recognize the blessings uh, uh, come from God, I'll give you more than what you can produce in many days. But they dealt corruptly with God. They gave up the Sabbath. Now, folks, how that applies to us today, we've got to be faithful to church. We've got to be faithful in our service to God. And I'm preaching to you tonight. If you're able to be in church, you ought to be in church. And, dear friend, we've got to assemble together. We've got to find our marching orders and serve God. So it was a prayer of repentance, a prayer of repentance. Let me read the rest of this verse. He said, we've dealt very corruptly with thee and have not kept the commandments. And so he's talking about the Ten Commandments, uh, the commandments of covetousness, the commandments of honesty, uh, the commandments of honoring parents, the commandment of putting uh, God first, uh, the commandment of not using the Lord's name in vain, and the commandments, he said, we've broken those. He went on to say, nor the statutes, these are the instructions of what we're to do and not to do, nor the judgments which thou hast commanded thy servant Moses. He said, we just haven't obeyed. And I confess our sins. It was a prayer of repentance. Then I love the positive part. When he goes through the negative of the perseverance and the penitence, the hard work, the repentance, then he comes to praying the promises of God. And he reminds God, and I use the word remind. God doesn't need reminding, but he tells God that he is reminded. Maybe that's a better way to say it, of the promises God had made. And if you look at verse number 8, he says this, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you among the nations. Now, that's what's happened. They were scattered. Nehemiah is praying this prayer from Babylon, hundreds of miles from home, uh, because of their sin. Verse number 9, But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the utter, uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. He said, Lord, as you commanded Moses, if you'll obey me, I'll bring you together and I'll prosper you. If you disobey me, I'll scatter you among the nations. So he praised the promises of God. Second Chronicles seven fourteen begins with, if my people which are called by my name and he ends that verse by saying I will heal your land that's what we hunger for and so we claim the promises of God if we'll humble humble ourselves if we'll confess our sin and if we'll obey not just confess the wrong but get active in the right if we will do that dear friend then 
then, my dear friend, we can see the blessings of God to bring healing to our land. Oh, we need healing. We need our land healed. We're fractured. We're broken. We're separated. We're headed in wrong directions. And so he prayed the promises of God. Then I've got to give you two more. He prayed his prayer involved others, or I'll use the word partners. In verse number 11, he says this, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. Nehemiah evidently got others involved in praying. He said, Lord, hear my prayer and hear the prayer of thy servants. For the last several weeks, I've been preaching across America my campaign for revival. And the first of three instructions from the book of Joel is this, is that we pray. And he makes the statement in Joel chapter 2 uh, that we're to weep between the porch and the altar. And there are many folks that are praying with me for revival in America right now. Uh, Nehemiah involved others others. And so tonight we need to get as many people praying for America as we can. And you are needed. Teenager, you are needed. Dad and mom, you are needed. Grandma, grandpa, you are needed. Young and old, everybody coming together as Nehemiah did in a prayer of praise, perseverance, repentance, and claiming the promises of God. We need every single person, every single person that we can in this matter of prayer. Now let me give you the last thing and use my last bit of time on this. Then his prayer involved petitions. He came to the specifics of what he was asking for. And here's what he said in verse number 11 at the end of that verse. I pray thee, thy servant, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. What did he mean? He said, now, Lord, I work for the king. You have put me in this place. You have put me in a place of providence. I work for the king. Now, I need you to speak to the heart of the king because I'm going to go talk to him and I'm going to request permission. And you find all this in chapter 2. I'm going to request permission from the king to go back to uh, Jerusalem and rebuild the wall around the city and put the gates back up and restore the security. He said, I am praying my petitions. Here's what I want you to do, God. He confessed his sin. He got everybody to pray. Uh, he uh, uh, reminded himself uh, and God of the promises. Now, Lord, he said, I'm going before the king. And you'll find in chapter 2 that he went not only before the king, uh, but the queen was there as well. And the king asked him the question when he saw him. He said, why is your countenance fallen? Nehemiah, I've noticed there is something wrong with you. I'd like to know what is wrong with you. And he gave him petitions and God answered his prayer. God worked on his behalf. I wish I could just repeat everything I said. I wish I could preach for an hour on this subject. Uh, but dear friend, this is the answer. This is the hope. Let's come together in prayer. Let's ask God to heal our land. Here's a good song as we go off the air. And I look forward to seeing you in the morning here at Clay's Mill Baptist Church on a beautiful Easter Sunday morning. He left the splendors of heaven for me And He took on the likeness of man He came to live in an ungodly world No spotless, the Lamb knew no sin All heaven's foundations were shaken that day But for changing His mind He would not He knew Exactly what he would go through. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. And how many tears have I brought to his eyes? I've heard him more often than not. Till infinite mercy responds to my cry. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. He went through the shame of the trial alone, through the darkness of death and the grave. He went through the pain of denial and scorn, the outcast and beggar 
to save. If I had the power to turn back the time, make amends for the things I forgot, a lifetime of goodness could never atone. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. And how many tears have I brought to his eyes? I've heard him more often than not. Still infinite mercy responds to my cry. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. And how many tears have I brought to his eyes? I've heard him more often than not. Still infinite mercy responds to my cry. Oh, he must have loved me a lot. Oh, he must have loved me.